switching gears, according to the most recent data from Stats Canada, about 43% of Edmontonians classify themselves as either Catholic or Christian. 36% are non-believers. The rest is divvied up across other faiths. And while the number of congregants, I think it's safe to say, has dipped in many places of worship in recent years, uh, that's meant that the very future of some of those buildings has come into question. Well, now there's a new proposal being discussed, suggesting that uh, one way the city could generate millions for its budget woes would be to perhaps withdraw some of the privileges on these holy houses. We're going to make dollars and cents of that proposal after the break. I know that uh, when City Council was in the midst of its budget deliberations here in recent months, I suspect some councillors were praying for a miracle to keep the tax increase low. Obviously, it didn't work. But what if that miracle presented itself in somewhat of an ironic way? The elimination of religious property tax exemptions. According to our next guest, it's an idea whose time has come. Ian Bushfield, executive director of the BC Humanist Association, as well as a former Edmonton resident on the line with us right now. Thanks for taking the time, Ian. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. Uh, So for the folks at home who might not be familiar, what, if anything, are Edmonton churches paying in taxes right now? For the most part, they're not paying anything on their property they own. We found a council report from back in November that staff presented to city council documenting all the different property tax exemptions that the city gives out. Most of these are mandated by the municipal government tax, so it's a provincial legislation. Mm -hmm. And for religious groups, there's about 700, I believe, in the city different properties, and they're worth about a billion dollars in assessed value. But they don't pay $20 million in taxes on that. Okay, and so that sounds like it would add up pretty quickly. Uh, you're talking about uh, 20 plus million dollars each and every year, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we were talking about budget deliberations there. Uh, just to kind of put things into perspective, what, what does $20, 25000000 million, what would that mean for me as a taxpayer, you think? It's one of those things where the city could do two things if they collected that money. They could reduce everyone else's tax burden. That's the typical way property taxes work. Mm-hmm. Or they could invest that money in other programs. They could increase their budget. So it's the city of Edmonton's budget, like most cities, is actually pretty big. So this would probably make your tax bill about 1% different. So not huge in the grand scheme of things, but it's more of a principle kind of issue where you go, are we subsidizing groups that are contributing to the broader benefit? And is this the best use of the money? Uh, on the flip side, you're going to have folks that will point out that uh, some of these faith communities have helped shape Edmonton in good ways over the years, and that you know, certainly some of them are already dealing with uh, dwindling uh, congregant numbers. Uh, by doing this, are we not putting these historic faith houses at risk? Well, and that's the big challenge. There's a number of different ways that municipalities can exempt properties from taxes. A lot of nonprofits in the city are exempt under a different category because we recognize that charities do give back in different ways and things like affordable housing, soup kitchens, all these things are very important Mm -hmm. and they're not all handled sufficiently by the city or the province or the federal government. And so we still have that place in our society. And the bigger question I think we're trying to raise is, are we default assuming that religion provides those or can we put the exemptions we're doing to better use by targeting just those, you know, positive uh, contributions, uh, or are we just kind of exempting them because we assume religion is good? Yeah. Uh, One thing I found interesting in uh, the op-ed that uh, you happen to publish for the Edmonton Journal, uh, we talk about, I I know there was a church downtown, for the life of me, I I couldn't quite find the name of it, but there was one that uh, essentially, uh, they they sold off uh, the the, the church and they they moved to a smaller venue and uh, were able to take that money to to, to build a new building and and to essentially sustain themselves a little bit further into the future. And uh, from the sounds of it, they're not the only ones that, that have done that here in Edmonton. And yeah, that was Westmount Presbyterian Church. It was a really interesting case because they, they right-sized their church, right? They recognized they had a dwindling co- congregation, as you pointed out, and they could have a smaller facility and build, uh, in this case, 16 affordable townhomes that were all net zero emissions. And so that provided something to a number of families 
uh, to be able to have housing, something that's so desperate. Like all of this kind of comes back to land use and what is the optimal way we can fit as many people as we need to into these cities in a way that is affordable. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, part of the article also makes reference to, and, and it's certainly, uh, I think, a point of contention for a lot of folks who who would like to see religion removed from uh, a more public conversation, more public funding, is the fact that the Vatican, uh, their their coffers are huge. Uh, they're they're filthy rich. Let's be blunt. Uh, but I mean, are they? Is it, are these local? Uh, faith houses, for example, on the Catholic and Christian side of the equation, um, are they in a position to be able to be buoyed by the Vatican, or is, is is that just not an option, really? I mean, I'm not the internal expert on the finances of the different churches and how they've structured mm-hmm. themselves, and I think it's important to push back on some of those challenges, especially for a group like the Catholic Church that has been around for so long that it has always been clever at structuring itself in a way to avoid accountability. We saw them be the church that took the longest to apologize for their actions in the residential schools in this country, right? Because they said, well, it wasn't the Vatican that directed that. It was the Canadian branches of the Catholic Church. And, you know, that answer didn't satisfy the Indigenous victims of those abuses. And I don't think that kind of dodge of an answer should satisfy these questions. And just, I want to make sure that something is very clear here, because there was someone who texted in yeah. and is like, well, if we're doing this with the Catholic Church, we have to do this with uh, you know, Muslims as well. We have to do that with their faith houses, too. Mm-hmm. You're talking about all faith houses, 700 yeah. of them here in the city, 700 yeah. properties. Yeah, we talk about all religious groups. I use the word church a few times in the article itself, and often... I'll speak more about churches because they are more prominent and a lot of minority faiths don't actually own their own property because of the history. So if you start up a new religion in Edmonton or here in Vancouver or anywhere, you probably don't have the capital to buy something. So these property tax exemptions actually do end up benefiting the older, more established religions, which is typically, you know, your Protestant or Catholic Christianities in a way that kind of, um, makes it harder to start up a new religion. Yeah, and, and, a little and unfair you, in that way. Yeah, and you use churches in the same way that I use Kleenex when I'm talking about tissue. It's a kind of a universal <laughs> term in some ways. Uh, so if the city decided, spur of the moment, that this was a solution that the, they would pursue to, ad- uh, to address their budget woes, uh, they can't do this on their own, can they? They would still have to go through the, the, the province, right? Yeah, and this is the way a lot of provinces are set up. So one thing I found while researching for this piece is the Edmonton city staff actually did look a couple years ago because the specific language of the provincial act is that the property used for divine service and the associated parking lot has to be exempt from municipal taxes. Well, if you look around town, there's a number of churches that own more property than that. Their land might be slightly bigger. Maybe there's an empty lot beside them. Maybe they own a thrift store or something like that, but it's all under the incorporated religious society. And the city actually started taxing some of those excess properties Uh, and I didn't get the number of how much that raised but we see that here in BC where there's an allowance for permissive exemptions for those excess properties and it really varies by municipality here what they do some tax at all like the city of Vancouver does uh, but other municipalities have a public benefit test and others exempt it all Uh, and so the city's kind of done what it can if they want to do more they'll have to pass a resolution to call on the province to amend the Municipal Government Act to give them greater control over over the tax decisions that affect their government. It only makes sense for those powers to ha- be handed to the people most directly affected by them, I think. Well, I don't think you've been following Alberta politics uh, in terms of who's controlling what these days. Um, Ian, I do appreciate the conversation today. Uh, very much an interesting thought, food for thought on this topic. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. There you go. That's uh, Ian Bushfield, uh, Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association, as well as a former Edmonton resident. Uh, He just penned a column for the Edmonton Journal uh, saying that uh, perhaps the time has come to eliminate the religious property tax exemption, which would apply apparently to about 700 different properties in Edmonton alone and would ultimately mean anywhere between 20 and $25 million additionally each year in city coffers uh, coming at a time when, uh, you know, it's it's difficult for us to, to get a balanced budget at City Hall. But of course, does that come at the expense of these religious groups being able to maintain their houses of worship? Uh, It's certainly a difficult balance on that front.